Hello YouTube. In this video, I'm going to introduce Neo-Aristotelian naturalism in metaethics. Uh, of course, as the name implies, this is uh, inspired by Aristotle, but uh, this is a contemporary metaethical position. Um, and in particular, I'm going to look at Philippa Foote's book, Natural Goodness. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's get into this. Uh, there are essentially two steps to Foote's project. First, she's going to give an account of what she calls natural goodness. Her claim is that living things can be evaluated as good or bad in a way that is independent of anybody's desires or goals. So there are certain features that make for a good wolf or a good cactus or a good puffball mushroom um, where this is a kind of goodness that has no relation to human concerns. So natural goodness is objective goodness. Then second, Foot will try to show that morality is a type of natural goodness. Uh, there are certain character traits that are good for human beings, regardless of what your own personal desires and goals might be. Uh, these character traits are objectively good, objectively virtuous. Uh, incidentally, although I'm not going to talk about this in any detail in this video, um, uh, neo-Aristotelian naturalism is often connected with virtue ethics. Um, so, you know, we, it, it, like moral goodness is often thought of in terms of like virtuous character traits. Um, indeed, sometimes it's kind of presented as like the meta-ethical foundation of virtue ethics. Uh, I don't think this is really a necessary connection, but these two positions do fit together quite smoothly, similar to how uh, Peter Railton's reductive naturalism fits quite smoothly with consequentialism. So yeah, not going to uh, sort of talk about, about that really, but um, that's just something to, I guess, keep in mind. Um, okay then, so let's begin with this idea of natural goodness. What exactly is natural goodness? Well, the first thing to say is that natural goodness is always going to be relative to a particular life form. So um, compare a, a statement such as verity is tall. Is this statement true or false? Well, in the absence of any further information, um, you know, we, we just wouldn't be able to say because there's no such thing as like tall period, right? There's tall without qualification. So if Let's say, let's say Verity is five foot nine, right? Is Verity tall? Well, we're not gonna be able to say unless we know what kind of thing Verity is. Um, if she's five foot nine, then she's gonna be tall relative to human women, but she won't be tall relative to giraffes. Um, you know, if, as, as a giraffe, we would say that five foot nine is abnormally short. So when I say that Verity is tall, there's an implicit relativization to the kind of thing Verity is. I'll be saying something like, you know, Verity is tall as a human woman. Now, according to the Aristotelian naturalist, the same is true for goodness. Goodness can only be understood with reference to the kind of thing we're talking about, with reference to the kind of life form. The traits that make for a good wolf are not those that make for a good deer. The traits that make for a good oak tree are not those that make for a good cactus. <coughs> but this isn't going to be a kind of, this isn't really like relativism about goodness, because goodness is still going to be objective. So it is an objective mind independent fact that if Verity is five foot nine, then she's tall relative to human women, because most women are shorter than five foot nine. Um, and similarly, she would be short relative to giraffes, because most giraffes are taller than five foot nine. So like if Verity is a human woman, then Verity is tall is true. And it's true independently of anybody's desires, goals, thoughts, feelings. The same is gonna be the case for natural goodness. So like, let's say we find a cactus with, you know, deep roots, and we might say, oh, those are good roots. What makes them good roots? Well, cacti use their roots to gather moisture, and in the dry environments in which cacti usually live, you need to go into deeper soil layers to find moisture, so they need to be deep roots. Um, so these are good roots, they're good for the cactus itself, regardless of what any human thinks about them. Now, of course, we can, if we want, use the term good uh, so that it's relative to human concerns. Like, if I'm looking for a paperweight, then a good cactus is one that serves this goal, and its roots are irrelevant. In fact, I suppose it would be good for it to have short roots, because, you know, that way I can, like, easily stand it on my desk. Um, but w the point is, we can also talk at least foot thinks of the natural goodness of the cactus. Natural goodness is 
objective, independent of human concerns. <clears throat> so to defend this kind of view, Foote draws on the work of Michael Thompson, in particular his uh, paper, The Representation of Life. So Thompson argues that descriptions of organisms uh, often involve normative claims that are based on the nature of the species to which the organism belongs. In particular, sentences of the form um, S's are F or S's do V. So for instance, bobcats are carnivores or bobcats breed in spring. So like, let's consider this sentence, bobcats breed in spring. How should this be interpreted? Well, first of all, notice that this sentence does not describe any particular individual bobcats. So it's not it's not like saying, you know, Verity and Sydney and David and such, so and so and so and so breed in spring. Um, these sentences are going to pick out specific individuals and describe what they do. Instead, there's some sense in which bobcats breed in spring is about bobcats in general. And yet it's not a universal generalization about all bobcats, because obviously not every bobcat breeds in spring. So like when I say bobcats breed in spring, I'm not making a claim about each and every bobcat. I can say, I can reasonably assert bobcats breed in spring, even knowing that some bobcats do not breed in spring. So another option then is just to think of bobcats breed in spring as being a kind of statistical generalization, right? Um, like maybe bobcats breed in spring means most bobcats breed in spring. <clears throat> but Thompson says actually even this doesn't work because it might happen that there is a spring in which most bobcats do not breed. Indeed, maybe just by chance, there's a spring in which no bobcats breed. Like maybe it's due to some natural catastrophe or maybe just for some reason, humans decide to intervene and prevent bobcats from breeding in one particular spring. So they all breed in the summer instead. Even so, uh, Thompson thinks it will remain true that bobcats breed in spring. So um, maybe like a, a better example to see this point would be to consider a claim like the sperm fertilizes the egg. So as we know, the vast majority of sperm that a male produces will fail to fertilize eggs, right? So when, when, we, when we make a claim like the sperm fertilizes the egg, we're, we're not trying to make a statistical generalization. Um, and a sentence like bobcats breed in spring works in a similar way. So it's, uh, I mean, obviously, if bobcats breed in spring is true, then presumably at least some bobcats at some point do need to breed in spring. But the point is that this is, not what is expressed by the proposition bobcats breed in spring, or at least that's not all that is expressed. The proposition that bobcats breed in spring, that can remain true even when no bobcats breed in spring. All right, so what's going on with this proposition then? Well, it's a claim about how bobcats live. Um, more precisely, it's a claim about how bobcats at the current time and in their natural environment, it's a claim about how they develop, sustain themselves and reproduce. It is, a normative claim. It tells us what it is to be a good bob bobcat. Bobcats breed in spring because that's the best way for bobcats to reproduce. If we find a bobcat that does not breed in spring, it is in this respect defective. It is not a good instance of its kind. So like bobcats breed in spring, but this particular bobcat is not doing that. So this particular bobcat is defective. Foote says that such claims, she, she calls such claims Aristotelian categoricals. So Aristotelian categoricals describe the life cycles of species in normative terms. So in general, um, it, like it, an Aristotelian categorical is going to tell us how some living thing in a particular environment develops and sustains itself and reproduces. And this requires distinguishing a good instance of the kind from defective instances of the kind. So, so the normativity is built into the Aristotelian categorical. And this is why the Aristotelian categorical can be true, even in circumstances when very few or even none of the species in question behave as it describes. Like if, if there are no bobcats breeding in spring, well, it's, it's still the case that bobcats breed in spring, but it would just be that every bobcat is defective in some way. Now, a crucial point here is that according to Foote, we can't describe the activities of any individual organism without reference to these Aristotelian categoricals, to these normative judgments about the kind of thing it is. So think about this, right? How would you describe the appendages coming from the upper portion of my body? Well, since I'm a human being, you would take them to be properly functioning arms. 
If I were a bird, you would instead take them to be defective wings that do not perform their functions properly. So the nature of these appendages, you know, so what, what these appendages are, it's not intrinsic to them, but is dependent on the kind of organism they are part of. So we have an Arist so the Aristotelian categorical is humans have two arms, right? And then that's, and it's on the basis of these sorts of Aristotelian categoricals that we can say, okay, the appendages coming out of my body, because I'm a human being, the appendages coming out of my body are arms, properly functioning arms. Or suppose you see me um, chew food, swallow it, then vomit the food back up, uh, or you know, regurgitate the food. What's happening there? Well, again, since I'm a human being, you know that something has gone wrong. Like maybe I have some illness, or I've just been overcome with severe anxiety, or the food I ate was tainted in some way. Because when human beings chew food and swallow it, it's to nourish their bodies. Something has gone wrong if the food is then ejected. But if instead I were a bird, well, this might not indicate a problem. Instead, in chewing the food, swallowing it, and then regurgitating it, I might be nourishing my young. Some birds will eat food, then regurgitate it into the mouths of their offspring. So the, the, what the individual is doing, like the very, um, like we, we can't describe what's going on in an individual organism without reference to its kind of life form without, and without using these Aristotelian categoricals. Okay, so each species has, has a particular kind of life cycle with you know, development, self-maintenance and reproduction. And there's a special set of normative propositions, the Aristotelian categoricals, that tell us for a given species how the stages of the life cycle are achieved. These propositions describe the process of development. They describe how nourishment is achieved. They describe how the organism defends itself, how reproduction occurs and so on. And this involves normative claims. Um, the way an individual organism should be is determined by the kind of organism it is. The way it should be is determined by what that kind of organism needs for development, self-maintenance and reproduction. And on this basis, we judge individual organisms to be good or defective in certain respects. Bobcat reproduction occurs in spring. It is good for the bobcat to reproduce in spring. So a bobcat that fails to reproduce in spring is defective. And when I describe something as a bobcat, I, the point is that I'm already committing myself to normative claims. I'm not just specifying some arrangement of cells, right? I'm saying this is a creature that ought to, <clears throat> that ought to walk on four legs, that ought to hunt smaller animals alone, that ought to breed in spring, that ought to nurse its young for approximately five months, and so on, right? It's not just like, yeah, I mean, it's not just a purely descriptive, like, you know, this is a particular arrangement of cells. There are normative claims involved just in calling something a bobcat. Or for another example, consider deer. The deer's form of defense is flight. Speed allows the deer to escape from predators. So it is good for the deer to be speedy, and it is a weakness if a deer is slow. And so like, um, if you imagine, for instance, a slow deer in a zoo, well, that deer might be no worse off in terms of survival and reproduction than a speedy deer in the wild. Indeed, the slow deer in the zoo might actually be better off because it will be provided with you know, regular food and medical care and so on. But even so, its slowness is a defect. It has not developed as it ought to have done. Slowness is a defect because the deer's form of defense is flight. So if this particular deer happens to be slow, even if it's not because it happens to be in, you know, it's lucky enough to be in a zoo, say, uh, it's not being put at any greater risk by being slow. Well, I mean, that just means that this particular deer got lucky, right, where it, it doesn't face any predators. Um, but the deer's form of defense is flight, so this particular deer is slow, so this particular deer is defective. Um, okay, now, so far I've uh, been talking about this just in terms of like the individual organism, but we also find that organisms have other regarding goodnesses and defects. Honeybees uh, dance to inform other honeybees of sources of food. And so a good bee needs to have the capacity to dance to relay information to its colony. Wolves hunt in packs. A good wolf needs the sort of sophisticated social instincts to coordinate with members of the pack. And you know, a free riding bee that does not dance but gains the benefit of information from others, or a free riding wolf that does not help with the hunt but still, you know, gains the benefits. Um, these these 
individuals are not behaving as they ought to do. Um, they are defective. Okay, so, so that's Foote's view of natural normativity. Now, we will see shortly how this can be extended to give an account of morality. So, so far we're just talking about like goodness and badness in general, and it's going to be goodness. There's, there's, there's a sense on this view of like goodness relative to life form, objective goodness relative to life form. Okay, so it's, it's objectively good for deers to be speedy. It is objectively good for wolves to have you know, the, the, the right sort of social instincts to coordinate with members of the pack. Um, it is objectively good for bobcats to breed in spring, etc. Um, obviously, this, this isn't moral goodness, at least not yet, but we will look at that shortly. But before looking at how to extend this to morality, it's, I think, worth pausing to consider whether this view of natural normativity, natural goodness, is reasonable. Um, so, <clears throat> Let's consider the nature of these Aristotelian categoricals. The claim, as we saw, is that even seemingly uh, uh, sort of even purely what seem like purely descriptive statements like bobcats breed in spring, um, the claim is that these are actually normative claims. Um, is this right? Well, um, it's probably right to say that in many cases statements such as bobcats breed in spring are not straightforward um, generalizations, you know. Um, so we are willing to assert such statements even when most bobcats do not breed in spring. But we might resist the idea that these statements involve any kind of normativity. Um, so in particular we might hold that really what this is telling us is, so this feature of these statements tells us something not about the world but about our concepts, about our need to idealize and simplify. An alternative account, then, is that these kinds of statements are idealizations. Um, I have a number of videos on idealizations uh, if you are interested in, uh, in, in you know, learning more about this kind of thing. So um, my video, uh, Science, Knowledge and Complexity, um, I've got a video in my Scientific Realism series on idealizations as well. So, you know, you can check those out if you're interested in more about this. But um, so, so just, I guess, briefly then. Um, consider uh, something like the ideal gas law, uh, the equation of state of an ideal gas. An ideal gas is composed of randomly moving directionless, uh, dimensionless, not directionless, randomly moving dimensionless particles that are not subject to friction. Now, we know that no real gas is an ideal gas. No real gas perfectly obeys the ideal gas law. Um, but the behaviour of real gases sometimes approximates that of, re of ideal gases. So there are circumstances where it's, it's very useful to treat systems in the world as if they were composed of an ideal gas. For example, we might model a star as if it were composed of an ideal gas. Um, now, it would be bizarre, I think, to say that there's anything normative about this. That, you know, so like when we model a star and we treat the star, like the hydrogen in the star as an ideal gas, when we model the star that way, it would be very strange, I think, to say that, well, this involves supposing that the real hydrogen that composes the real star, like, ought to be an ideal gas, or is in any sense aiming towards, you know, behaving as the ideal gas. The ideal gas is just a, like an idealization. We, uh, we introduce this notion to simplify our models in the face of an otherwise uh, impossibly complex world. Um, idealization is a tool that we use to simplify our representations of the world. So the thought then is maybe something similar is going on in um, the bobcat case and, and in, gen in general in like talking about uh, the features and characteristics of organisms. So when we think and talk about bobcats we are working with this idealized concept bobcat and the idealized concept bobcat specifies what we might think of as a kind of prototypical bobcat. It lists the features that are standardly associated with bobcats. So this bobcat is, you know, an organism that breeds in spring, that nurtures its young for five, for about five months, that, uh, you, you know, hunts alone, etc. Um, actual bobcats may diverge in all sorts of ways. Uh, there need not be any normativity built into this, it's just the biolo you know, biological populations, real biological populations, are extremely complex and varied, so we introduce simplifications, 
uh, and idealizations to help ourselves understand and talk and think about those real po populations. Now, very often these idealizations might be based on what is typical for the population. So if I ask somebody to describe the size, shape and color of, of a bobcat, well, that might just be like a summary of what is normal for bobcats. Like it's a summary of the size of most bobcats, the shape of most bobcats, the color of most bobcats, etc. But idealizations don't need to be mere statistical generalizations like that. So notice that when we try to understand bobcats, we're going to consider them as a biological species, as a population of organisms that interbreed and reproduce new generations over time. That plays a central role in our understanding of like why bobcats came to be, how they came to be, and how the population is sustained over time. And so from this perspective, we're going to focus on how they best bring about reproduction. So we say bobcats breed in spring um, because you know that specifies presumably the best conditions for bobcat reproduction. Um, you know, like again, you know, similarly when we say something like the sperm fertilizes the egg, well, the, you know, the focus there is on how reproduction is brought about. Um, and, um, you know, so yeah, you know, the, the fact that uh, the vast majority of sperm will fail to fertilize any particular egg is irrelevant. So the point is then is that um, this is just an alternative way of thinking about what Foot has called the Aristotelian categoricals, right? Instead of taking them to be normative claims, we might just take them to be idealizations, which, um, and, and as idealizations, then it's not going to follow that there's any like normativity here. Um, indeed, they don't really tell us anything about how the world works. It's, they're telling us something about how our concepts work. Um, so again, this is just an alternative view. Um, but are there, you know, problems, let's say, with the, uh, the view that Foote proposes? Um, well, there may be. So <clears throat> according to Foote's interpretation of uh, these Aristotelian categoricals, natural goodness is relative to kind. Um, it's relative to the type of life form in question. So since the deer's form of defense is flight, good deer are those that are speedy, you know, slowness in deer is a defect. And, and this is supposed to be a kind of objective goodness independent of human judgment. There are uh, several potential objections to this. So first problem. Um, so one problem here is that any given individual will be a member of lots of different kinds. And we might suppose, okay, why should we suppose that the relevant kind is the species? Um, we noted that for deer living in zoos, it makes no difference how speedy they are because the zoo will already protect them from predators. Foote says that even so, a slow deer in a zoo is in that respect defective. Um, so the assumption is goodness is relative to the species in general and the natural environment of the species. But why? <laughs> right? Why suppose that the goodness of this individual deer is relative to deer in general in their natural environment rather than deer living in zoos? I mean, it's a member of both kinds. Um, so yes, it is, a, it is a member of the kind deer, but it's also a member of the kind deer living in zoos. And as a member of the kind deer living in zoos, this particular deer might be very, very well off. Certainly it's not you know, it's not any worse off. Um, so, uh, so that's one concern is is how we sort of spec how we decide which kind um, goodness is relative to. Um, a second issue is that even if there are good reasons for defining goodness relative to species specifically, um, species is indeterminate. So in biology, there are a variety of different species concepts. Uh, for example, the biological species concept defines species in terms of reproductive isolation. Two organisms are members of the same species, just in case they are capable of interbreeding and producing fertile offspring. Uh, the ecological species concept says that two organisms are members of the same species, just in case they occupy the same adaptive zone. The, there are various phylogenetic species concepts that are defined historically that hold that members of a species must be descended from a common ancestor. Each, each organism in a species must be more closely related to every other organism in the species than to any organism outside the species. Basically, members of a species must have a shared evolutionary history. Um, that's very, very brief. I've got a couple of videos on the species concept if you want more detail here. 
Um, suffice it to say for now that Biologists use a variety of different concepts for carving up biological populations into species. And these different concepts do not classify all organisms in the same way. So two organisms may be members of the same species according to one species concept, but members of different species according to another species concept. So the question is, like, which of these concepts tells us what a species really is? Um, you know, so actually, there, you know, a lot of people will say that, that, that like none of them do, um, that there isn't really any fact of the matter, like what, what a species really is. We have a bunch of different ways of carving up uh, populations into species and, you know, they're all, they're all like appropriate for different purposes, but um, like there isn't, you know, like a one true species concept. And so that then becomes a problem because it's like, well, which of these concepts do we use for determining the Aristotelian categoricals? Uh, we're going to get, because, because these define species in different ways, we're going to presumably get different Aristotelian categoricals um, out of different species concepts. Third, even uh, if we do specify a species concept, species are not uh, uniform. Species do not have essential properties. Um, I mean, if there is one rule in biology, it is variation. Species are constantly changing um, and species sometimes diverge into new species. I mean, so when we encounter a, a, an abnormally slow deer, instead of supposing that this deer is thereby defective, why wouldn't we just take that as one of the many variations in traits found in deer? Um, it may of course be that this abnormally slow deer is quickly killed and maybe the mutation, the, the slowness mutation is quickly driven out of the population. Um, actually that's quite likely because the majority of mutations are deleterious um, or at least they're not you know, advantageous. But uh, lots of species have gone extinct almost entirely. Presumably it, the Aristotelian, the Neo-Aristotelian would not say that the members of those species were all defective. Um, so, you know, the last dodo may well have been a very good dodo. Um, so the mere fact that a slow deer is not likely to survive and reproduce doesn't in itself entail that it's defective. Um, one characteristic of any species is evolvability, the capacity of the species to evolve through natural selection. Evolvability requires that new variations are introduced into the population. And from this point of view, the abnormally slow deer doesn't seem defective in any sense. Variation in speed is just one aspect of the evolvability of deer. Uh, evolvability <clears throat> is useful in changing environments and in the real world environments are in constant change. So if we ask like, is speed good for the deer? Well, suppose the environment has in which the deer live is invaded by a new predator and this predator just happens to target animals that move fast but ignores those that are slow. Maybe where this predator evolved the slow moving animals tended to be poisonous. So the predator targets the normal deer and then leaves the abnormally slow ones alone. Um, you know, in this kind of situation obviously okay the slow deer are going to start to benefit um, that, that, that trait will then spread through the population <clears throat> And, and who knows, maybe this particular uh, population of deer will end up diverging from uh, deer elsewhere and, you know, there'll be a speciation event and it will become a new species. Um, but anyway, the point is, given that environments can change in unexpected ways, the survival of a species over time requires that it generate variation in traits. So, um, so then... Okay, why is that trait variation going to be uh, defective? <clears throat> you know, why when encountering an individual that exhibits some variation, why, why treat that variation as a defective instance of the old kind rather than a perfectly well-functioning instance of some new kind? Okay, let's uh, put these concerns aside and return to Foote's argument. So if foot is right, uh, we have a naturalistic account of uh, normativity. Goodness is understood in terms of the natural features of plants and animals. There is such a thing as the objective goodness of a deer or a cactus or a wolf. You know, there's something it is to be a good deer or a good cactus, regardless of how that relates to human concerns. 
But what does all of this have to do with morality? Well, in making moral judgments, we are judging the goodness of particular types of human behavior. Uh, Foote says, and I quote, there is no change in the meaning of the word good between the word as it appears in good roots and as it appears in good dispositions of the human will. Moral goodness is a type of natural goodness. Now, uh, Foote notes that there is actually an obvious um, concern about this kind of view. There's an obvious difficulty here. So what is good for plants and animals has to do with what is characteristic of their life cycles. What is involved, so what's involved in development, survival and reproduction in organisms of that kind. Um, so uh, as Foote puts it, what conceptually determines goodness in a feature or operation is the relation for, of, for the species of that feature or operation to survival and reproduction. Okay, the trouble with this is that it seems clearly implausible to understand moral goodness, to understand what human beings ought and ought not to do, just in terms of what promotes survival and reproduction. Um, consider, for instance, a person who chooses to be childless, um, who chooses not to reproduce, and instead focus on their career. Well, surely that's fine, right? We don't want to say that abstaining from reproduction is morally wrong or defective in any way. Um, Foot herself says there are many other aspects of human goodness that may give a person reason to renounce the family life. Um, nevertheless, Foot does think that this notion of natural normativity uh, allows us to give an account of what's required for human good. So um, how do we sort of square this? Well, Foot's Foot's solution to this problem is a little bit obscure to me, but I think that he, so. Here's here's the ba I'll try to give a, the basic idea. Um, Okay, so first of all, let's sort of think about what human goodness is. Let's think about human goodness, um, uh, you know, in this like natural goodness framework. So we need to think of this in terms of the kinds of life that are characteristic of human beings. And uh, this is going to involve like various capacities. So humans need the capacity to engage in abstract thought. They need to learn language, they need capacities of imagination and creativity, they need to produce art, they need to find humour in jokes, um, they need certain <clears throat> physical structures like a larynx that can produce sounds, uh, functioning ears so that they can hear the speech of others, eyes that function well enough to recognise faces at a glance and you know to sort of recognise this like body language and, and so on, like non-verbal communication. <clears throat> These capacities uh, make possible the kind of sophisticated social interactions that are characteristic of human life. A human being who does not have cap these capacities is thereby deprived. Um, so like if you if you do not have functioning eyes, that's a natural defect in the same sense as a deer that cannot run quickly. By contrast, you know, we don't need to see in the dark. I mean, of course, we might want to be able to see in the dark and we might develop technology that allows us to do this, but a human being who has poor vision in the dark is not thereby defective. Um, you need to see well in you know, normal everyday light, but if you can't see well in the dark, that's not a defect. Um, you know, compare, for instance, like owls. Right? Owls are predators, they hunt primarily at night, they need to see in the dark in order to hunt effectively. But human beings, we don't need to see in the dark. Um, it's not a defect if we can't. It is a defect if we can't see in, you know, sunlight. Okay, there are also goodnesses and defects that concern how we behave with respect to other people. And these are particularly important in human beings because we are, you know, social creatures, right? Children are dependent on their parents for much longer than is normal than in most other mammals. Uh, the first age of reproduction is comparatively older. The average human literally could not survive alone, but depends on the environment created by a social group. Um, so the development of normal human capacities, like, you know, the capacity to use language and so on, and the survival of the individual human, that requires interaction with others. Okay, so Foote thinks that there's going to be a, a kind of concept of a good human life, and this is going to underlie the diversity of other human goods, for instance, the diversity of art. Um, there's, there's obviously a huge variety of different art forms, right? And the creation of all of this art is only possible once we have certain 
physical and mental capacities and once certain social structures are in place. So a human being may well renounce reproduction, but this is because humans can pursue other goods. And they can only pursue those other goods if they are well endowed with respect to their physical, mental and social capacities. Notice, after all, that um, failure to reproduce is not a defect in humans, only when it's a voluntary choice. If a person wants to reproduce but is unable to do so for whatever reason, then in that respect they are defective. So, you know, maybe they have some medical problem that prevents reproduction, or maybe their social skills are too poor to find a partner. Um, in these respects, that person is defective. The child-free life is good when it's the life you have chosen, but choosing the child-free life requires, you know, weighing up reasons for and against reproduction. It requires um, the ability to sort of consider other types of life projects, for instance, devoting yourself to art, um, you know, or, or like, uh, I don't know, devoting yourself to philosophy, whatever, right? Like you, you weigh up the reasons for and against having kids, you consider other life projects, um, it requires this capacity for practical rationality. So, so the good human life is determined by what is characteristic of the life cycle of human beings, certain physical, mental and social capacities. And it's precisely because we have those physical, mental and social capacities that we are able to make choices uh, like you know, choosing to renounce reproduction. Um, but 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 this gives us a notion of human goodness, right? Human goodness is a matter of having these physical, mental and social structures. And that's going to determine the goodnesses and defects of individual humans. So um, now notice that there's sort of two important points here. Um, in uh, and, and that's that first, a great deal of human activities require cooperation with other people, as we've noted, as we've already noted, right? In, in order to achieve these physical, mental and social capacities that are required for human goodness, we need social interaction with others, right? Achieving human goodness requires this kind of cooperation and social interaction. The second point is humans don't just act on instinct, right? We, once we develop rational capacities, we can reflect on our behavior and desires. So when faced with a situation where I might cooperate at some cost to myself, like let's say I find some tasty berries in the bush and I could share them with the rest of my tribe or I could keep them all to myself, um, you know, I can ask myself, how should I behave? And I may well decide to override my cooperative instincts. I may, I may decide to act selfishly. And there's a, a pretty radical difference between humans and other living things in this respect, because, you know, other, you know, of course, other animals make choices, right? And other animals are going to have inclinations for one thing or another. But other animals can't reflect. They can't, um, like, ask, you know, why do I engage in the activities that I do? Um, are the things that I desire actually worth desiring, right? You know, why sh should I do this? They can't sort of step back from their desires and instincts and reflect on them and, you know, like, consider other ways of acting and so on. Um, so these two facts, right, that human goodness depends on cooperation, but that humans are capable of rational reflection, these mean that we develop norms for behaviour. We inculcate in people the sense that they owe each other things. And with this, of course, we are in the moral domain. We are in the domain of moral norms. Um, moral norms are concerned with our voluntary behaviour, and it's the behaviour that promotes human goodness, that promotes the kind of physical, mental and social capacities um, that are part of human goodness, behaviour that does that is good, and behaviour that is, is morally good, and, um, you know, behaviour that undermines it is morally bad. So consider how this plays out in a specific situation, right? We say humans ought to keep promises. It is good for a human being to keep promises. Why? Well, humans are a cooperative species. The goodness of any individual depends on lots of support from others. Uh, it depends on engaging in sophisticated social interactions. But at the same time, each person is self-interested. So we need ways to demonstrate that we are trustworthy. And we also need to be able to rely on you know, the trustworthiness of others. Now, none of us have the means of like literal mind control um, sometimes we can rely on the fact that we have 
authority, or perhaps the fact that other people have affection for us. So I may have authority, I may have power over others so that I can order them around, um, and if I'm strong enough, I be, might be able to trust that they will obey me. Or if people have affection for me, maybe I can expect that they will want to obey my requests. Maybe I can trust that they will, you know, want me to be happy. Um, so, so I can trust them for that reason. But obviously these sorts of tools are very limited. Generally speaking, people are equal in their capacities. Um, you know, well, bro broadly speaking, you know, there's, it's like nobody is, um, is so strong that they can control everyone, you know. And um, generally speaking, people don't all love each other. So, uh, you know, relying on power or affection or whatever, that's not going to get you very far. Um, what is to be done? Well, you know, we all benefit from cooperation and trust. This is key to living the kind of life that is distinctive of humans. So we develop norms of promise keeping. And, you know, under this norm, when I say something like, I promise to do X, I thereby place myself under an obligation. Failing to keep this obligation damages trust, which damages cooperation, which prevents the attainment of the good human life. So that's why I ought to keep my promises. Trust and cooperation are essential to achieving the good human life. Uh, if I fail to keep my promises, that's going to undermine trust and cooperation. So um, Foote sort of summarises the general point. She says... Um, Men and women need to be industrious and tenacious of purpose, not only so as to be able to house, clothe and feed themselves, but also to pursue human ends having to do with love and friendship. They need the ability to form family ties, friendships and special relations with neighbours. They also need codes of conduct. And how could they have all these things without virtues such as loyalty, fairness, kindness and in certain circumstances obedience? So from this picture of you know, the good human life, we can, we can get moral norms. Okay then, so the general point then is that, first of all, human goodness is not simply a matter of survival and reproduction, but it is still going to be understood in terms of these Aristotelian categoricals, which tell us the kind of life distinctive of human beings. So we say, humans cooperate, humans create art, humans seek knowledge, humans weigh the benefits and costs of different life projects. These are distinctively human, right? You know, bobcats don't create art. Um, bobcats don't weigh the benefits and costs of different life projects. But these are still, these are claims about the human life cycle, just as much as bobcats breed in spring is a claim about the bobcat life cycle. And then character traits like courage, honesty, curiosity, wisdom, adherence to norms, such as promising, promise keeping, these traits are required in order to do these things. So we can understand natural goodness in terms of Aristotelian categoricals. That gives us a kind of natural normativity that applies to all living things. And then human goodness is a kind of natural goodness. Um, and there's a kind of human goodness in the broader sense, as when I say that blindness is a defect. Um, that's, that's not a moral judgment. Moral judgments come in with our evaluations of people's voluntary actions. We make moral judgments of human beings because human beings, unlike all other living things, are capable of rational reflection. And that means that human beings, unlike all other living things, can, you know, rationally choose to act in ways that either promote human goodness or undermine human goodness. Uh, if you act in ways that promote human goodness, well, that's morally good. If you undermine it, that's morally bad. Um, but the point is that, you know, so... Yes, only humans are subject to moral evaluation, but moral goodness is not fundamentally different from other kinds of goodness. Moral goodness is just a kind of human goodness. Human goodness is just a kind of natural goodness. So, well, hopefully you can see how all of that fits together. Okay, that is uh, that is Aristotelian naturalism. That's the uh, neo-Aristotelian naturalism. That's the general picture. Um, okay, let's turn to some uh, objections to this. <clears throat> you know, can we understand moral goodness as a type of natural goodness? Well, one of the major concerns about this Aristotelian naturalist approach is that when we examine the characteristics of human beings, the account of natural goodness that comes out is going to be seriously contrary to our uh, considered moral judgments. So, 
This objection is given by Scott Woodcock in his article uh, Philippa Foote's Virtue Ethics Has an Achilles Heel. First, uh, Woodcock argues that the Aristotelian naturalist is too restrictive. The Aristotelian naturalist condemns as immoral or as defective a number of um, characteristics that are actually perfectly fine. We've already noted that one concern about deriving moral goodness from what is characteristic of the human life cycle is, uh, well, you know, what about things like the choice to be child-free? Um, now, we've seen that Foote tries to avoid this problem by, you know, appealing to sort of the fact that humans are rational creatures who can pursue many different goods, and we may reasonably choose uh, uh, to pursue, say, art <laughs> over uh, the family life. Um, but there are other cases where uh, Aristotelian naturalism um, kind of runs into similar problems. So on Foote's account, any disability will presumably be a defect, right? Um, but there are many people in disabled communities who resist this way of viewing their conditions. <clears throat> For example, there are many people in the deaf community who will refuse hearing aids and other forms of technology to restore hearing because they take the deaf community to be its own cultural group with distinctive languages, traditions and behavioural patterns. Like sign language is its own language and uh, the concern is that if you were to, so if you were to cure deafness, uh, like cure in scare quotes there, um, that would just eradicate this culture. So like talk of curing deafness is a, a kind of euphemistic way of talking about the eradication of, of a culture. Um, like people in these, in these communities, well, they take themselves to be a unique cultural group. And uh, I mean, I suppose even in characterizing it as a disability, um, I'm uh, perhaps speaking in a way that they might object to. Uh, it's, just, it's, just another, it, it's just another culture, it's just another way of life. Um, it looks like, on Foote's view, this is going to be a defect. Um, not a moral defect, obviously, but it still will be a defect. And um, that is something that we might think is, uh, is just the wrong way of looking at that. Similarly, in um, like autistic communities, people sometimes talk of neurodiversity, uh, that there are at least some forms of like high-functioning autism that are that are not defects. Um, again, on the Aristotelian naturalist view, it looks like those are going to count as defective. <clears throat> so um, there are respects then in which it might be argued that uh, Aristotelian naturalism is too restrictive. Then a second objection is that Aristotelian naturalism is in other respects too permissive because it fails to condemn many traits that are characteristic parts of the human life cycle, but that we would judge to be bad. So one example of this that Woodcock suggests is uh, the limit to altruism. Of course, humans are a remarkably cooperative species. All the same, our cooperative tendencies are highly context dependent. So when we think about the like Aristotelian categorical here, it's not going to just be humans cooperate or humans behave altruistically. We will need to specify, well, what kind of altruistic behavior and to whom is the altruism directed? Woodcock notes that in practice, altruism and cooperation are often connected to in-group favoritism and prejudice against outsiders, to xenophobia. So altruism is supported towards individuals that you regularly interact with and that you can trust to behave in similar ways to yourself. So mechanisms are required to maintain group uniformity. Outsiders could be free riders. So to ensure that altruism remains beneficial, altruistic groups need norms that prevent invasion from outsiders. The result is human beings are altruistic towards members of what they identify as their own group, but they are biased, sometimes violently biased, against members of other groups. Um, xenophobia is just as much a natural tendency as altruism, and in fact, the two may the two things may be closely connected. It may be that, like the, you know, the kind of evolution and maintenance of altruism in human societies requires uh, xenophobia against outsiders. So this would presumably lead to an Aristotelian categorical, such as human beings tend to be biased against outsiders, or human beings discriminate against outsiders, and. A human being who fails to do this, who adopts a commitment to, you know, cosmopolitan and egalitarian attitudes, uh, is thereby defective. <clears throat>
Um, and, you know, surely we don't want to, to draw that conclusion. You know? Surely we don't want to say that egalitarianism is, like, thereby morally wrong. Um, and again, you know, the important thing to note is that this bias against outsiders uh, on, on the, the suggestion is that this may not be separate from altruism. It may be like an aspect of how our altruistic attitudes emerged and were sustained in earlier societies. Um, but, you know, like, so if so, okay, we get the Aristotelian categorical, human beings are biased against outsiders, and then if you're committed to egalitarianism, you are defective, maybe even uh, morally defective in some way. Another example is given by uh, J. Odenbar in, or Odenbor in uh, the article Nothing in Ethics Makes Sense Except in the Light of Evolution. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> consider the account of rape given in evolutionary psychology. Evolutionary psychologists, well, some of them, um, argue that rape is a kind of adaptation. It's a behavioural strategy that evolved because it promoted reproduction in some circumstances. I do have a couple of videos on this, actually, uh, if you're interested in the details, but um, here's the basic idea. So, for women, reproduction is extremely costly. There are many dangers to pregnancy. Um, it requires a great investment of time and energy. The average woman, no matter how devoted she was to reproduction, would be able to have no more than, like, I don't know, a dozen or so children. So, as a result, women have evolved to be choosy, right? The, like, you don't, you don't waste valuable resources by reproducing with inferior males, okay? So women have, have kind of evolved to be extremely choosy about who they mate with. For men, by contrast, reproduction is easy. All it requires is that he have sex. A man could have hundreds of children in his lifetime. And so a man can maximise reproductive success by impregnating as many women as possible. Uh, so that, like, there's kind of... For men, there's, like, selective pressure to just have sex with as many people as possible. Um, now, some males are low status. They are unlikely to be chosen as a mate by any women. But males in general are much stronger than women. So from this point of view, uh, rape emerges as a kind of strategy for maximising reproductive success, right? Instead of putting in all of the work that would be required to attract women. So like if, if somebody's a low status male, right, they just have, you know, they're like physically unattractive, um, you know, they have no resources, um, you know, etc. Right. Uh, they, they just don't have any like good social skills. Um, well, you know, they could put in all of the work that would be required to attract women, but um, there's a good chance that would be pointless. Uh, you know, so uh, from that from that point of view, the low status male can maximize reproductive success by just forcing women to reproduce, right? As long as, as long as this male is stronger than women and is able to force them, that emerges as a strategy for maximizing reproductive success. So, now I should say, this explanation of rape is extremely controversial. Um, actually, the, I think the consensus is pretty firmly against it at this point. Uh, again, see my videos for the details here. Um, but the point is, you know, it could have been true. I mean, even if we think that this explanation is wrong, like, you know, we can't sort of, you know, rule it out a priori, right? Like, it might have been true. Um, and if so, then it looks like we would have an Aristotelian categorical, uh, which says something like, unchosen low-status males rape human females. Um, and, and then an unchosen low-status male who has, you know, the, the urge to rape somebody would then be defective uh, if he resists that urge. Um, you know, he, he ought to act on the urge. He ought to go and rape. Um, but, you know, that would just be absolutely outrageous. Uh, so you know, that's an outrageous conclusion. Um, so, <clears throat> again, you know, like, the, the point is not whether or not this explanation is true. It's just, like, it, it might have been true. And, uh, you know, and, and then if it were true, you know, it seems to entail this, uh, this absurd... Uh, conclusion that there are some men who m like morally ought to go and rape women. Um, so hopefully you can see the, the the sort of general problem here, right? The general problem here is that there are some, I guess what we might think of as like natural tendencies that human beings might have that actually we judge to be very, very bad. Um, now, one general response to, to this kind of objection is you know, Aristotelian naturalism doesn't 
claim, as, as we've seen, it doesn't claim that human goodness is simply a matter of what promotes reproductive success. So um, there are many goods in human life, art, knowledge, happiness, freedom from pain, cooperative activities, and so on. The problem with behaviours like discrimination and rape is that they undermine these other goods. And, you know, of course, we can easily find scenarios where discrimination and rape have resulted in social problems, where they've prevented the you know, flourishing of societies. Indeed, people who engage in vicious behaviours often make themselves worse off, um, you know, because, because we do benefit in many ways from, from working together. So um, we might sort of make this kind of point, right? Like, um, we can't just look at this in terms of what promotes survival and reproduction or in terms of how human beings evolved. Um, that may be part of the story, but it's not the only part of the story. Uh, so when we consider these other goods, um, we can see that, uh, like, you know, xenophobia and rape and so on are clearly bad, even from the Aristotelian naturalist point of view. So um, does this response work? Well, one concern about this is that it's not at all obvious that vicious behaviours do always undermine these other goods. So, I mean, nothing stops a rapist from, you know, creating art, right? Or from, um, you know, cooperating with uh, various other people. Um, I mean, I, I, like, you know, um, it, it's, it's the, 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 the damage here is going to be restricted to, um, like, very specific people. But um, like, broadly speaking, I mean, somebody could, you know, rape someone and then go on to do all sorts of things that we might think of as being, uh, as, as, as involving goods, uh, the sort of goods like seeking knowledge, creating art, um, you know, even helping other people, um, you know, learning other languages, etc. Moreover, uh, as we've seen, Xenophobic attitudes, for instance, may actually be connected with altruism. So uh, it may be that resistance against outsiders actually promotes greater cooperation in the in-group. That, like, that might be sort of part of how altruistic attitudes were, like, arose and were sustained. Um, so in that sense, then, it's, it, you know, it's like, it's not the case that xenophobia is just always going to um, cause problems. Uh, second, and perhaps more importantly, there's a concern here that we are, that what's going on here is that we're using a prior moral theory to determine which Aristotelian categoricals count as specifying the goods of human life. So the Aristotelian naturalist thinks that goodness is determined by the natural facts about human beings. But unless we are excessively optimistic about human nature, uh, surely we're going to expect that there are some natural tendencies that we judge to be bad. You know, we're going to draw a distinction between the good natural tendencies and the bad ones. And then the question is, how do we draw that distinction? How do we, you know, decide which tendencies are good and which are bad? Well, this, the argument will be this requires a commitment to a prior moral theory. It's not something that just like drops out of our description of the natural tendencies of humans. So we might, for example, like let's take xenophobia. We might say xenophobia is bad because it decreases overall utility. So like, yes, okay, xenophobia may well have been a product of natural selection. Yes, um, pretty much all human societies have been xenophobic to one degree or another. And yes, xenophobia might even promote cooperation within a given group. Like the, if a given group is you know, violently resistant to outsiders, that might actually help the members of that group, like, uh, form stronger bonds among themselves. But surely it would be better if we could overcome this tendency and cooperate universally, right? That would promote greater happiness for the greater number of people. So we should resist this, uh, ze these xenophobic tendencies. And, you know, we should try to uh, adopt more egalitarian attitudes. But notice that if we say this, it seems like we're appealing to an independent standard of evaluation to determine which aspects of human nature we endorse and which we reject. So we endorse the altruism, right, But because it promotes general happiness or whatever, but then we reject the xenophobia because, um, because it doesn't. So we're falling back onto something like utilitarianism. Um, 
the Aristotelian categoricals about human beings do not make this kind of normative distinction between altruism and xenophobia. The Aristotelian categoricals are going to tell us the circumstances in which humans tend to be altruistic, the circumstances in which they tend to be xenophobic, and that's it. Um, like, if we're saying that some of these tendencies are good and some of them are bad, it looks like we need an independent standard of evaluation, and it's not clear how we can get that from Aristotelian naturalism. Um, I mean, really, this discussion points to what might be a more general objection. So we've seen that for the Aristotelian naturalist, judgments of goodness are always relative to the, to the kind of life form in question. What's good for an individual human being is fixed by what's characteristic of the human life cycle, in some sense. But um, one problem here is that we can reject the kind itself. I mean, this is obvious in some cases, right? So I might say that a good mosquito is one that is effective at sucking blood. But we don't want mosquitoes. In an ideal world, there would be no mosquitoes. Um, and a person might take the same attitude to the human species. This is, in fact, an attitude that some people have. Um, so consider misanthropes. Uh, the misanthrope sees human beings as deeply morally flawed. Uh, as a misanthrope sees it, humans are selfish, callous, stupid, dogmatic, greedy, hypocritical, violent, destructive of the environment. Um, these, these sorts of traits are found in almost all individuals and across almost all our in institutions. So the misanthrope thinks that human, humanity is you know, rotten to the core. <clears throat> now, there may still be like a kind of natural normativity in the Aristotelian sense. So it may be the case that we can still talk about like a good human being. Um, it, so uh, uh, on this kind of view, a good human being is going to be one who selfishly looks out for their own interests um, or something like that. You know, that is characteristic of what humans do. A good human being is is like selfish, violent, dogmatic, etc. Because that is characteristic of, of what humans do. But this doesn't tell us anything about what we morally ought to do because humanity as a kind is defective, right? Just as with like mosquitoes, right? A good mosquito sucks blood, but we don't want mosquitoes. Uh, similarly, the misanthrope rejects humanity. <clears throat> now, even if we disagree with the misanthrope's attitude, it seems perfectly coherent, right? Um, like it seems, you know, yeah, there's, there's like, there's nothing kind of incoherent about just rejecting humanity, saying like that it's, it's a bad kind. Um, but it's not obvious how to even make sense of the way the misanthrope talks of goodness uh, on the Aristotelian naturalist view. Uh, a similar point might be made, for instance, about transhumanists. Transhumanists think we should use technology to improve the human condition and transform ourselves so radically that we would no longer be recognisably human. So just like misanthropes, transhumanists reject the kind. They reject humanity and they aim for something better. Right. But like, how do we make sense of that if talk of goodness is always going to be, you know, relative to what is characteristic of humanity? The general point here is that it seems that we don't always make evaluations from within the perspective of a given kind. We can also step back and ask, is this kind itself good or bad? And if there is sufficient technology, I might even be able to ask, should I remain a member of this kind or should I change myself to become a member of a different kind? You know, if, if transhumanism is successful, uh, then um, like maybe one day I will be faced with that question. Maybe one day I will be faced with the uh, opportunity to become something other than a human. Um, and Aristotelian categoricals in themselves are not going to answer such questions. Aristotelian categoricals only allow for moral evaluation relative to the kind. Um, but that uh, we might think is, um, you know, that's actually just not how moral evaluation works because um, one of the key parts of like making moral judgments is also making judgments of the kind itself. So there's, uh, if this objection is right, there's a gap between natural goodness and moral goodness. Okay, well, uh, yep, that's, uh, that's it for today. Um, that was Aristotelian naturalism and um, some of the uh, potential objections to it. Um, thank you for watching. Goodbye.